So we'll continue on with Tony's outstanding review of the anatomy. It's really the key to all of this, as well as the pathophysiology of shoulder instability. So here's the first question. Again, the blue indicates something we want to look at closely. And if we see uh, here, 27-year-old, it's a young patient, falls on a scaffold, outstretched arm. So if it's not a wrist, it's not an elbow, but it feels his arm, really his shoulder is going to pop out. What specific exam finding was likely to be present? And so with this, we're going to find, go through these, and the most appropriate answer is Kim's test because uh, we have the x-ray demonstrating here where we had a posterior subluxation, we had the radiographs, and the Kim's test is a posterior subluxation dislocation event where you've actually torn the posterior labrum and or the capsule. We'll go over this Kim's test finding in a second, but it's basically putting posterior stress on the labrum and evoking pain which is the difference between anterior and posterior instability is posterior instability uh, demonstrates pain with provocative maneuvers, sometimes instability, but pain is the predominant finding, whereas anterior instability is clearly an apprehensive type of finding. As we see here, 50% of the traumatic posterior dislocations remain undiagnosed. This is what you may be questioned on because it is the number one claim seen in an emergency department in terms of posterior shoulder dislocation. The risk factors of this are bony abnormality or pre-existing ligamentous laxity, and there may be some frequent flyers in the emergency department with uh, multidirectional uh, type of issues, especially with a posterior dislocation. As Tony very nicely reviewed, he's done a lot of work on this, is lot, the number one thing we see is subluxations, dislocations, is the posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament is torn. Next, we also see posterior bank heart legion, which is the same thing as a posterior labral tear or a posterior bank heart. A reverse hill sax, as we'll show in a second, is associated with non-reducible and difficult to reduce dislocations. A posterior labral cyst can have chronic reverse bank card implications. We actually develop a cyst posteriorly, and it's very unique to posterior instability. Anterior instability does not develop this. They can also be a posterior glenoid rim fracture or an impaction fracture. There could be a lesser tuber tuberosity fracture that's also associated with posterior dislocation, and you can get a very large capsular pouch. The posterior band of the anterior glenohumeral ligament, as Tony nicely pointed out, is the primary restraint in internal rotation, especially with the arm in forward flexion and internal rotation. Uh, the superior glenohumeral ligament, it also statically stabilizes posterior subluxation with flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. And it also deepens the glenoid, as was pointed out earlier. These are generally acute versus chronic, as well as voluntary versus involuntary. But unlike anterior instability with posterior instability, involuntary is not always that bad. People can uh, push their shoulder out of joint, but it, if they have a posterior labral tear, they may be amenable to surgery, and they're not what we call the psychiatric uh, issues uh, issues after the uh, after a instability uh, event. Here's another good question here. This is a classic question. 26-year-old football offensive lineman. So you almost already know the answer to as soon as you start with the first five words. Positive jerk test, positive Kim test, most likely diagnosis here is posterior labral tear. And here you can see a posterior labral tear very nice. It's a little bit different from the anterior tear because of the way the glenoid and the labral morphology is. But you can see uh, here either an acute event where the blood forms a hematoma and you can get a very nice almost arthrogram image. Or if you have gadolinium, you can see that posterior labral tear. And actually, there's a secondary component where you actually may have a small flap of the labrum, which is also specific to posterior instability. When you look at this uh, from, we looked at this, and there's a nice review article that we reviewed and reviewed a lot of our patients with this, especially uh, people that did a lot of bench pressing in the military and football players. They demonstrate pain with flexion, adduction, and internal rotation of the arm. So it's this provocative maneuver here in the front. Examination demonstrates prominent posterior shoulder and coracoid, especially if it's subluxed. And if it's dislocated, this is the key. The shoulder is locked internally rotated. So they come in and they're perfectly fine because they're just wearing a sling. And so that's why this is the number one shoulder missed diagnosis in the emergency department and something you are likely to get tested on, as we'll show here in a second with radiographs and good examination. We do want to get a good positive posterior load and shift, and here you can see it here. We're going to translate, hold the scapula stable from behind. Uh, your clothes have to be off to be able to palpate the scapula, and you're going to be able to move this around back and forth and see if you can posteriorly strain the inferior capsule.
So if we can play this uh, video, you can see a good posterior load and shifting exam. And the arm is in flexion and internal rotation, which is straining the posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, as well as the posterior labrum. And you also get a click as this humeral head subluxes over the back. And there's that flexion, internal rotation, and a posterior applied load. He does not like that. It's very painful. And you can see we're just doing this here uh, a couple times to demonstrate the test. This is all very akin to the jerk test, and you can get a clunk here. And we almost showed a jerk test here because we had a clunk, and they had a positive posterior subluxation. The arm in 90 abduction internal rotation is a little bit different. But again, a positive jerk test, a positive posterior load and shift indicates posterior instability until proven otherwise. Here's another good question. A football player, again, first few words, we're already thinking about that. Sublux is shoulder while blocking. Why is blocking an issue? Because the arm is in internal rotation and flexion. The jerk test is positive. The most likely pathology here? Well, you could say maybe a bank art lesion, but the more appropriate uh, answer here is the Kim lesion. You can see some people here, 15% on orthobulge would put bank art. Maybe that's the uh, shotgun rea uh, reaction of the answer. Maybe it is a bank art lesion, but the more appropriate and better answer here is the Kim lesion. The Kim test is demonstrated here, and here's a very good article uh, from 2005 when Sung Ho Kim out of Korea described this. It's positive when pain is present. Remember, it's not necessarily apprehension. It's positive with pain. The patient is seated, arm 90 degrees abduction, flexing the shoulder forward, 45 degrees of forward flexion, and then you apply this actual load on the elbow and a posterior inferior force in the upper humerus. Basically, you're stressing the posterior or inferior aspect of the shoulder, and a posterior stress test is the same type of thing where you elicit pain, and that's a positive test. This is a load and shift grading. Uh, you may be tested on this, uh, but it mostly will be in a question stem. They'll say the patient comes out 2 plus, it translates to the rim or translates over the glenolabral rim, and it's symptomatic. That's instability posteriorly till proven otherwise. The radiographs are very important with posterior instability, especially in emergency department. This is where your question is going to come from. The axillary lateral, the best view to demonstrate a dislocation. Here you can see it here. You've got a posterior dislocated shoulder. Your coracoid, you always want to look for. Here's your coracoid that always points anterior, so we know the shoulder's in the back. If the patient can't abduct, the arm for axillary, they're too painful, they have too many problems in the shoulder, uh, you, uh, we want to get a Velpo view. This light bulb sign indicates also a posterior subluxation or dislocation event. It just doesn't look right. See how flat the glenoid is? It's not correct, and you end up with this type of picture because the humerus is overlapping the glenoid posteriorly. Here's a big one with a big, large reverse hill sacs that's locked. And this is a big problem. You can see that this can be easily missed unless you get a good uh, image. But this is a Velpo view, which you can get the image and show it well. So here we go. Another good question. 32-year-old male electrical worker. Isolated right shoulder pain. A fall from six, week, uh, six feet. You maybe are thinking electrocution or maybe it was just a fall. Uh, we always think about seizures, electrical workers, shocks. Those are the ones that get posterior dislocation because the muscles just pull that shoulder forcibly back. You can't get a good axillary review. What's the next step in management in the emergency room to get the diagnosis and see what you need to do? Well, MRI, as we all know, is not great. Some people may think that, but the best thing we need to do is get a better radiograph if you can't get, an, uh, can't get the x-ray. And here we are here. We're going to get the Velpo view, and that's the correct answer. CT scan may be a correct answer. I'm going to go back. CT scan may be a reasonable answer because we have CT is very easy to get in the emergency, most urgent emergency departments, but it's not on here uh, for a reason, but that could be an appropriate answer as well. We do like that for chronic dislocations to assess for bone loss and other issues. You can see that major bone loss here. Uh, MRI is very good, especially an arthrogram even better, or an MRI with a hematoma after an acute injury, and the hematoma lights up very nicely like this gadolinium, and you see, can see a Kim lesion of the deep inferior labrum. Here's another good example of a Kim lesion. The anterior labrum right here is perfect. The Kim lesion here demonstrates a crack, and that's a, a partial posterior labral tear due to recurrent posterior stress in the posterior labrum. Here's some more examples. This is posterior stripping of the posterior labrum and capsule, and uh, also a little bit of a bone injury here. You almost have a bony avulsion back here. There are some other examples uh, demonstrated here.
you can also see it on the sagittal oblique image. Here you can see a tearing and stripping all the way down here of that posterior inferior labrum. And that's another good image. Here's, uh, I'm sorry, posterior inferior back here. Uh, here's the anterior labrum. It probably extends up here in the front a little bit, but you can see that the posterior labrum is uh, completely torn off as well as the inferior glenohumeral ligament posteriorly. Non-operatively, if they dislocate it, we immobilize it just like anything else. This is always attempted for all your posterior dislocations, and that's, your, that's also a question. What's the treatment of choice where initial posterior dislocation is uh, reduction and then immobilization and external rotation? Most of them reduce spontaneous loads, recurrent subluxation episodes, recurrent spontaneous, uh, excuse me, recurrent uh, micro trauma when you're lifting, when you're blocking football. Uh, the technique at 10 to 20 degrees of external rotation of the elbow at the side, and then you can advance physical therapy. Well, what about the treatment? If you look at Jim Bradley's work, and he's got now 200 of these shoulders he's followed for a long time, and 89% of these are able to return to sport. So it's very successful arthroscopically to repair these if you have recurrent posterior instability with a labral tear or a Kim lesion, and they do very well and get back to their sports. You can do a capsular shift as well as a labral repair, and we will talk about rotator interval in a second, but you may want to consider rotator interval closure, which is the front of the shoulder as demonstrated here, if you have a high bite and score or hyperlaxity, and that could certainly be something to add in. And you might almost be in a multidirectional type of instability patient with that, so you might want to add that in as well. Uh, opening wedge osteotomy, if you have glenoid retroversion, that may be an answer and a question, uh, although it's highly controversial. And then large reverse hill sacs are for chronic dislo with chronic dislocations. Usually these are uh, a long time out. Uh, you have to manage these reverse hill sacs with uh, transfer, such as the McLaughlin procedure. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, the arthroscopic repair is shown here. You can do anchors and sutures. Uh, this has also been a question. Uh, lateral decubitus uh, probably visualizes, and uh, I know Tony and I are certainly uh, biased on this, but the lateral decubitus really allows for improved visualization. This high lateral portal here, this 7 o'clock posterior lateral portal that Tony and I have also written up is a really important portal to get in the right, uh, in the right position. Rotator interval, the, the area between the supraspinatus and subscapularis. It augments the shift. It's controversial. I'm going to show a little bit more here in a second. Um, thermal shrinkage, this is historical. Uh, many of you have probably not even seen this or heard of it but it's really contraindicated at this point due to many complications. Back in the day, we thought that you could shrink the collagen, it breaks the collagen, cross-links, it relinks it, but what we found was that the tissue uh, was irreversibly damaged and we couldn't, and the capsule became a big issue and we just didn't enjoy the same results as a classic bank art type of repair. Complications uh, can be stiffness, recurrence, necrosis, and we want to uh, immobilize these for anywhere for about five to six weeks and focusing on scapular strengthening and stabilization, which is a really key in posterior instability. Here's a uh, reverse hill sacs. Uh, here's a reverse hill sacs here. I'll point this out with a green arrow. And here's a McLaughlin procedure where you actually transfer in the lesser tuberosity. So you've cut off the lesser tuberosity here, transfer it in, and fix it with anchors. You can also use iliac crest bone graft or some certain allografts to help reconstruct the cartilage here that is missing with a reverse hill sacs. Uh, so here's the McLaughlin complications, stiffness, AVN, avascular necrosis because you're cutting lesser tuberosity as well as osteoarthritis. Hemiarthroplasty is occasionally indicated, especially in the slightly older person, if they have a very large lesion, and this is a test question, more than 50% of the articular surface more than six months old. If they have these types of things in there, and it'll be pretty obvious, a hemiarthroplasty is the right answer. Total shoulder, if they have glenoid arthritis or glenoid problems, in addition to a humeral head, usually in that older patient over age 60 to 65, then you're thinking about a total shoulder replacement so that they can function reasonably well without pain. Most common complication after labral repair, you may get this, is stiffness. The next most common is recurrence. Stiffness is usually not a big issue for most patients, though, and it's usually only usually less than 10 degrees in certain planes. The plane you're going to lose it in posterior instability repair is internal rotation. So as you're looking down here, uh, you have a loss of internal rotation. You can get some degenerative joint disease. We really don't know if this is due to the instability itself, the initial instability event, shearing the cartilage and just injuring it, 
or uh, due to other uh, issues, even post-surgical. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.